Welcome back. Second lecture and our first look at Iraq. Last time, the Iran Iraq War launched by our enemy's enemy, Saddam Hussein. The lecture today, the response to our former allies, or at least our former friends' invasion of his neighbor, Kuwait. This is, of course, Saddam Hussein's. August 1990 invasion of Kuwait, which resulted in 1991's Desert Storm, a war some of you may be actually old enough to remember. I certainly remember this Gulf War. I was 14 years old, in middle school, heading into high school next year, very exciting stuff. And this was the biggest thing that had ever happened. The summer of 1991, I was in Washington with my parents at the victory parade for this war. It's a war that made America feel good again about its military. Because up till this war, the United States was experiencing a hangover. A hangover from Vietnam. This was a good cure for that hangover. Before we get to the war, let's look at the reasons why it happens in the first place. In the main, there are three reasons. First, financial reason. Iraq is heavily in debt to its neighbor and ally, Kuwait. Fifteen billion dollars of war debt to Kuwait alone. Moreover, moreover, as we saw in the documentary, Iraq's own oil capacity had been utterly destroyed in the war with Iran. However, Kuwait's facilities and fields beautifully intact. Just sitting there, right for the taking. Finally, Last piece of the puzzle. 25th of July, 1990, one week before Iraqi tanks would roll into Kuwait, the American ambassador to Iraq, April Glasby, said these exact words. Diplomats choose their words very, very carefully. Words mistranslated, misunderstood. They take very great care with their words. She tells Tariq Aziz, her counterpart, the foreign ministry, I have a direct instruction from the president, at this point George H.W. Bush, I have a direct instruction from the president to seek better relations with Iraq. We have no opinion. We have no opinion on Arab-Arab conflicts like your border disagreement with Kuwait. Thus, one week later, Saddam Hussein feels confident that his harebrained scheme to steal Kuwait and annex it might actually work. After all, better relations, no opinion on Arab, Arab conflicts. Let's go back in time just a little bit first. To one year earlier, when the new president's new Secretary of State, James Baker, the new president being George H.W. Bush, his new Secretary of State meets with Tariq Aziz, the man with whom Donald Rumsfeld had met in 1983. In October of 1989, these two men met. We have documentation for it via a cable from State Department from James Baker to the embassy here in Iraq, apprising them of what was discussed in this meeting. Yet another secure cable. On the table was financial assistance for Iraq. Congress had recently slashed $600 million off of a farm aid bill for Iraq from $1 billion to $400 million 
here at the top, the second page. Again, reference to the GOI, the Government of Iraq's use of CW, chemical weapons. If we turn to the third page, we see something very, very interesting indeed. Point four, Baker notes that Iraq wants good relations with the U.S. Later on down in that page, in point five, you see something even more remarkable. Aziz, Tariq Aziz, said this disturbed the government of Iraq greatly because during the war, we had discussed the Gulf region in a frank manner. Iraq has said clearly that it wants to maintain the whole region intact, including the individual countries, that it has no bad intentions against any of them. He stressed, Tariq Aziz stressed, that Iraq's objective was and is good relations with them all, particularly Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. No designs, desire to see the Gulf region remain intact. October 1989. One year later, less than one year later, the invasion happened. On the 8th of August, 1990, while I was on a family vacation at Yellowstone Park, Americans woke up to see this on their television screens. It's a busy morning at Fort Bragg, where this morning on through the night, troops are preparing to leave for the Mideast. There they will join U.S. forces said to be already on the ground in Saudi Arabia. In the meantime, Iraqi troops are still positioned at the borders of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq. As tensions continue to rise, this is today, Wednesday, August 8th, 1990. On NBC News, this is Today, with Bryce Gumbel, Deborah Normal, and Joe Garagiola. And good morning, welcome to today on a Wednesday morning and to what figures to be the special edition of today as we continue to take a look at the events in the Mideast. They are fast changing this morning. We're going to take a look at all the possibility and the problems involved. We can tell you the President is planning an address at 9 o'clock this morning. NBC News will cover that. Saddam Hussein is said to be planning an address 90 minutes after that. We'll also be featuring that. But let's get a part of the news now, the latest events with Faith Daniels. Good morning, Faith. Thanks, Brian. Good morning. Elements of several elite U.S. Army units have arrived in Saudi Arabia, the vanguard of a combined air, sea, and land force designed to help stabilize the turbulent Middle East. Their aim is to protect Saudi Arabia and to get Iraq Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. But there are no signs that Saddam is about to back down. He plans a major announcement today, and there is speculation that he may announce the annexation of Kuwait. One of the American units sending troops is the 82nd Airborne Division based at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Kenley Jones is at Fort Bragg this morning. Good morning, Kenley. Good morning, Faith. I don't know how well you can see the end of the runway at Pope Air Force Base, but this is as close as we can get. The air base has joined Fort Bragg and is the staging area for overseas operations. During the night, two C-141 Starlifter transport planes took off about a half an hour apart, bound for the Middle East, presumably, of course, we don't know their cargo, nor much else about this mission. But while the Army has been able to keep departure times and specific troop movements under wraps, the deployment itself has been an open secret. Army assault helicopters, the kind capable of tank warfare, have been flying to the staging area where they could be loaded aboard transport planes. Long-range transports, like the C-141 Starlifter, have been landing as well. But the most solid clue that men of the 82nd Airborne were being deployed was when they called families to tell them they were leaving, but couldn't say where they were going. Are you brave? No. 
Of course, that kind of uh, attitude was developed after the 82nd Airborne's successful operations in Grenada and Panama. But Iraq, with its well-equipped, well-trained army and unpredictable leader, would be a much more difficult foe. Faith? Thanks, Kenley. American warplanes and warships are also showing the flag in the Middle East. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney has just come back from there. And today, National Correspondent Catherine Couric is at the Pentagon this morning. Katie, good morning. Hey, good morning. The U.S. is flexing its military muscle in Saudi Arabia. Some troops, warplanes, and support, support equipment already being put in place there. A defensive posture for now, but as Saddam Hussein does not pull out of Kuwait, Pentagon sources say that U.S. forces are prepared to go on the offensive. A number of F-15s and F-16s have left the U.S., including these taking off from Langley Air Force Base in Norfolk Tuesday afternoon, equipped with extra fuel for the long flight. They will be joined by others like them in the next few days, bringing a total of more than 100 U.S. fighter bombers to Saudi soil. Once positioned on Saudi airfields, the planes will be protected by some 2,000 members of the 82nd Airborne Division and other U.S. military units. The Screaming Eagles, the Army's elite air assault team, and their Apache helicopters are part of the package, as are troops from the 24th Mechanized Division. The details of this military plan were worked out between Defense Secretary Dick Cheney and Saudi King Fahd. Cheney arrived at Andrews Air Force Base early this morning after two intense days of shuttle diplomacy. A stop in Egypt reportedly sealed the deal for President Hamdi Mubarak to commit several thousand Egyptian soldiers to a multinational force. Other Arab nations may follow suit. And the Saudi army, bolstered by more than $35 billion worth of U.S. equipment, is not without muscle. As U.S. warplanes and soldiers cross the Atlantic, American sea power already in place can help stave off further Iraqi attacks. The USS Independence aircraft carrier and her battle group are in a holding pattern near the Persian Gulf. These ships will be joined by the USS Eisenhower, traveling from the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal. The USS Saratoga left Mayport Naval Station Tuesday afternoon. That aircraft carrier and its 14 support ships should be arriving in the Eastern Med to replace the Eisenhower in about 10 days. Now, Faith, there is some confusion over Egypt's commitment to all this. It's unclear at this juncture. The Egyptian foreign minister and other Egyptian officials have denied the report, but one Pentagon official told me this morning he's not sure what decision has been made. But we're likely to hear much more about that when Egyptian President Hazi Mubarak addresses his nation at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Faith? All right, thank you, Katie. We do have word from Britain today that it will, in fact, send troops, so there is some support coming from the Allies. The Washington Post this morning is quoting intelligence sources as saying Iraqis appear to be loading weapons on combat aircraft. Iraq has used chemical weapons in the past, but as Katie Corrick told us this morning from the Pentagon, there has been no confirmation there as yet. All right, some familiar faces there. Brian Gumbel looks the exact same age now as he did almost 20 years ago. Catherine Couric, heard of her? They mentioned that President H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush, would be addressing the nation. Let's go to his address. In the life of a nation, we're called upon to define who we are and what we believe. Sometimes these choices are not easy. But today as president, I ask for your support in the decision I've made to stand up for what's right and condemn what's wrong, all in the cause of peace. In my direction, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, as well as key units of the United States Air Force, are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. I took this action to assist the Saudi Arabian government in the defense of its homeland. No one commits America's armed forces to a dangerous mission lightly, but after perhaps unparalleled international consultation and exhausting... What you're hearing is still the hangover from Vietnam here. Recall that when U.S. troops were deployed to, to Lebanon in 1982, the news reports talked about similar stipulations. These troops will be gone in 30 days regardless of the situation. Don't worry, America. We're not going to get stuck in another Vietnam. What George H.W. What George Bush is doing here is, is reflecting that fear and trying to assuage Vietnam syndrome. Every alternative 
it became necessary to take this action. And let me tell you why. Less than a week ago, in the early morning hours of August 2nd, Iraqi armed forces, without provocation or warning, invaded a peaceful Kuwait. Facing negligible resistance from its much smaller neighbor, Iraq's tanks stormed in blitzkrieg fashion through Kuwait in a few short hours. With more than 100,000 troops, along with tanks, artillery, and surface-to-surface -surface missiles, Iraq now occupies Kuwait. This aggression came just hours after Saddam Hussein specifically assured numerous countries in the area that there would be no invasion. There is no justification whatsoever for this outrageous and brutal act of aggression. A puppet regime imposed from the outside is unacceptable. The acquisition of territory by force is unacceptable. No one, friend or foe, should doubt our desire for peace, and no one should underestimate our determination to confront aggression. Four simple principles guide our policy. First, we seek the immediate, unconditional, and complete withdrawal of all Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Second, Kuwait's legitimate government must be restored to replace the puppet regime. And third, my administration, has been, as has been the case with every president, from President Roosevelt to President Reagan, is committed to the security and stability of the Persian Gulf. And fourth, I am determined to protect the lives of American citizens abroad. Immediately after the Iraqi invasion, I ordered an embargo of all trade with Iraq, and together with many other nations, announced sanctions it both froze all Iraqi assets in this country and protected Kuwait's assets. The stakes are high. Iraq is already a rich and powerful country that possesses the world's second largest reserves of oil and over a million men under arms. It's the fourth largest military in the world. Our country now imports nearly half the oil it consumes and could face a major threat to its economic independence. Much of the world is even more dependent upon imported oil and is even more vulnerable to Iraqi threats. We succeeded in the struggle for freedom in Europe because we and our allies remain stalwart. Keeping the peace in the Middle East will require no less. We're beginning a new era. This new era can be full of promise, an age of freedom, a time of peace for all peoples. But if history teaches us anything, it is that we must resist aggression or it will destroy our freedoms. Appeasement does not work. As was the case in the 1930s, we see in Saddam Hussein an aggressive dictator threatening his neighbors. Only 14 days ago, Saddam Hussein promised his friends he would not invade Kuwait. And four days ago, he promised the world he would withdraw. And twice we have seen what his promises mean. His promises mean nothing. Strong words. Carefully chosen words. Blitzkrieg. Appeasement, 1930s. Our one-time ally would be painted very quickly as a 1990 version of Adolf Hitler. Saddam Hussein must have been extraordinarily surprised by this turn of events. After all, we had stood by him steadfastly in the 1980s when it was readily apparent he was using chemical weapons on a large scale. April Glasby had told him on July 25th, we have no opinion on Arab, Arab conflicts like your border dispute with Kuwait. Saddam Hussein must have been very, very surprised indeed. What followed was Operation Desert Shield, because for many, many, many months, the United States military presence was purely defensive, in defense of the kingdom, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. 
It was not until 1991, in January, that Operation Desert Shield became Operation Desert Storm. And the reason it took so long, the reason it took five months, is because there was little appetite in the American public for a war against Iraq. After all, this was an enemy who had used chemical weapons willy-nilly on his own people and enemies. This is the man who possessed, on paper, the fourth largest army in the world. We should know something about that army, given our relationship in the 1980s. Dangerous foe Saddam Hussein was perceived to be. No blood for oil was a common refrain you heard over and over again. President H. W. Bush went to the Congress for a declaration of war. It was not unanimous by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, the Senate almost voted against the war resolution. I want to go back. Sorry about that. 52-47 in the Senate was the vote. A larger margin in the House, but hardly a ringing endorsement of military action. This was the vote on the resolution to turn a defensive posture into an offensive posture. And the fears of the American public here are reflected in the votes the Senate, and in the House. But Desert Shield did become Operation Desert Storm, January 16, 1991. This is what Americans saw on their TVs that day. And as best we can tell, the attack on Iraq began Maybe 45 minutes ago, it's now 7.41 Eastern Time, 3.41 in the morning in Baghdad. The President is going to talk in about an hour and 20 minutes from now, briefing with the White House. And I'm told that that speech is expected to last about 10 to 12 minutes, and the President has worked his way through something like four drafts of it. We've, I've heard from other people here that the speechwriters have been uh, on almost 24 hour duty for days. They're absolutely bleary out of the exhaustion, and in part that's because they've had to work on different drafts without any real knowledge of exactly what's going to happen. The President has said, however, to have been at work on these, uh, these various drafts for several days, which goes back to the point you and I were talking about earlier, that he has obviously been contemplating this for some time. Uh, he, between 6 and 7 is when he uh, made his call. The leaders were told that he did it from the small study edition of the Oval Office, and he had uh, Vice President Quayle, uh, National Security Advisor Scowcroft, and uh, his Chief of Staff, Governor Sinema, with him when he made those calls. He's also called some foreign leaders, I'll list those to come later. Okay, very thanks very much. A number of people, obviously, politicians uh, and statespersons of all uh, persuasion are going to want to talk uh, within the next 24 hours. The Kuwaiti ambassador to the United Nations has made a statement in which he says the military action fulfills the wish of the international community to liberate Kuwait from the Iraqi aggression, and he wishes a victory for this operation. Uh, it used to be called Desert Shield, but uh, when it was a standing operation, uh, defending Saudi Arabia against any further Iraqi aggression and perhaps waiting for offensive action. Now that it is a war, the President is calling it Operation Desert Storm. Uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who made that last ill-fated attempt to try to talk Saudi Hussein into a political settlement, uh, has also uh, expected to make uh, some statements uh, a little later this evening. But you will recall, if you're watching or listening to the reporting over the last several days, he came back extremely depressed, in the words of ABC's David Ensor, who flew back uh, from Europe with him. Uh, Saddam Hussein seemed much more concerned about offering tea and coffee uh, to the Secretary General than engaging in any kind of a dialogue at all uh, with the Secretary General. And there are people, by the way, those who know Saddam Hussein better than most, not that many people know him very well at all, who believe that one of the things in his mind uh, is to try to get this battle started, to save the Iraqi people and his other supporters uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere in the developing world, that he has stood up to the American imperialists 
and then perhaps try to sue for some kind of peace before uh, his country is totally obliterated. Uh, that is, if you believe that the American military and the other 25 nations are run, aligned against him in the Gulf are capable of doing the damage which so many military planners have said they are capable of doing. Great human to us again. Great. Peter, just one brief uh, further thing. The, uh, we've been trying to get some sense of the nature of this attack, whether this is a preliminary attack with limited goals or whether this is all out. And a uh, spokesman of Fitzwater simply would tell us that the attack will be, and is being, swift and massive. Swift and massive is worse. Okay, Rick Hume, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we said earlier that uh, the price of oil on the Houston and New Orleans markets, which were still open about a half hour ago, had jumped $3 a barrel immediately on the news uh, that America had gone to war against Iraq. They're now $35 a barrel. The Tokyo stock market, uh, which is perhaps as sensitive to uh, uh, political and military happenings of any uh, in the world has fallen uh, by almost one and a half percent. It is down 300 points at the moment. War has begun between the United States and Iraq. I say the United States and Iraq because we are not yet sure that other members of the coalition, namely the British and the French, who have their capability, have engaged in this initial assault against Kuwait and against Iraq, but that is news to come. We will go away and try to pull in some more information over the next three minutes, so we will be back after this and a word from your local ABC station. We hope you'll stay with us. The year is 1991. There is no internet. That's years in the future. Instant news was only available via television or the radio. We live in a world inundated with information. Not the case in the early 1990s. We're going to see now Destination. It's a serious address designed to allay those Vietnam fears. The evening, 16th of January, 1991. While the world waited, Al-Sad installed, more damage was being done to the fragile economy to the third world, the emerging democracies of Eastern Europe, to the entire world, including to our own economy. The United States, together with the United Nations, exhausted every means at our disposal to bring this crisis to a peaceful end. However, Saddam clearly felt that by stalling and threatening and defying the United Nations, he could weaken the forces arrayed against him. While the world waited, Saddam Hussein met every overture of peace with open contempt. While the world prayed for peace, Saddam prepared for war. I had hoped that when the United States Congress, in historic debate, took its resolute action, Saddam would realize he could not prevail and would move out of Kuwait in accord with the United Nations resolutions. He did not do that. Instead, he remained intransigent, certain that time was on his side. Saddam was warned over and over again to comply with the will of the United Nations, leave Kuwait or be driven out. Saddam has arrogantly rejected all warnings. Instead, he tried to make this a dispute between Iraq and the United States of America. Well, he failed. Tonight, 28 nations Countries from five continents, Europe and Asia, Africa, and the Arab League, have forces in the Gulf area standing shoulder to shoulder against Saddam Hussein. These countries had hoped the use of force could be avoided. Regrettably, we now believe that only force will make him leave. Prior to ordering our forces into battle, I instructed our military commanders to take every necessary step to prevail as quickly as possible and with the greatest degree of protection possible for American and Allied servicemen and women. I've told the American people before that this will not be another Vietnam. And I repeat this here tonight. Our troops will have the best possible support in the entire world and they will not be asked to fight with one hand 
tied behind the back. I'm hopeful that this fighting will not go on for long and that casualties will be held to an absolute minimum. This is an historic moment. We have in this past year made great progress in ending the long era of conflict and cold war. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN founders. We have no argument with the people of Iraq. Indeed, for the innocents caught in this conflict, I pray for their safety. Our goal is not the conquest of Iraq. It is the liberation of Kuwait. It is my hope that somehow the Iraqi people can, even now, convince their dictator that he must lay down his arms, leave Kuwait, and let Iraq itself rejoin the family of peace-loving nations. Thomas Paine wrote many years ago, these are the times that try men's souls. Those well-known words are so very true today. But even as planes of the multinational forces attack, attack Iraq, I prefer to think of peace, not war. I am convinced not only that we will prevail, but that out of the horror of combat will come the recognition that no nation can stand against the world united. No nation will be permitted to brutally assault its neighbor. No president can easily commit our sons and daughters to war. They are the nation's finest. Ours is an all-volunteer force, magnificently trained, highly motivated. The troops know why they're there. And listen to what they say. For they said it better than any president or prime minister ever could. Listen to Hollywood Huddleston, Marine Lance Corporal. He says, let's free these people so we can go home and be free again. He's right. The terrible crimes and tortures committed by Saddam's henchmen against the innocent people of Kuwait are an affront to mankind and a challenge to the freedom of all. Listen to one of our great officers out there, Marine Lieutenant General Walter Boomer. He said, there are things worth fighting for. A world in which brutality and lawlessness are allowed to go unchecked isn't the kind of world we're going to want to live in. Listen to Master Sergeant J.P. Kendall of the 82nd Airborne. We're here for more than just the price of a gallon of gas. What we're doing is going to chart the future of the world for the next hundred years. It's better to deal with this guy now than five years from now. And finally, we should all sit up and listen to Jackie Jones, an Army Lieutenant, when she says, if we let him get away with this, who knows what's going to be next? I call upon Hollywood and Walter and JP and Jackie and all their courageous comrades in arms to do what must be done. Tonight, America and the world are deeply, deeply grateful to them and to their families. And let me say to everyone listening or watching tonight, when the troops we sent in finish their work, I'm determined to bring them home as soon as possible. Fear, fear of Vietnam. This is 1991. American combat troops were pulled out of South Vietnam in 1973. Less than two years later, in 1975, Saigon fell. 
and we escaped from the roof of the American Embassy in UH-1 helicopters. So just 16 years had passed since the fall of Saigon, which means 1991 is closer to Vietnam than we are to 1991. Great, great fear here of what was going to happen in this conflict. Some reputable military analysts believed that there would be 100,000 American casualties, that Saddam Hussein would use chemical weapons. Let's see how that war did turn out. January 17, 1991, 3 a.m. Iraq time. Hell breaks loose on Baghdad. The formidable firepower of the coalition, amassed primarily by the United States over the past five months, reveals its awesome might. Televisions worldwide start showing images of a supposedly foolproof, high-precision campaign of so-called surgical bombings said to hit nothing but Iraqi military targets. start rolling in Kuwait. The Allied offensive gets fast and deep into Kuwait without encountering significant resistance. The Iraqi military leviathan is nowhere in sight. And the troops still present in Kuwait are simply no match for the modern coalition forces. On February the 28th, 1991, having fulfilled its mission, the international coalition abruptly stops the war against Iraq. The last Iraqi troops are evicted from Kuwait or taken prisoners. Victory is total. Five weeks of bombing, 100 hours of a ground offensive into Iraq and Kuwait. The war is over. Very relieved, President George H.W. Bush addressed Congress in the evening of the 27th of February, 1991. Let's watch. Thank you, President. And Mr. Speaker, thank you, sir, for those very generous words, spoken from the heart about the wonderful performance of our military. Members of Congress, five short weeks ago, I came to this house to speak to you about the State of the Union. We met then in time of war. Tonight, we meet in a world blessed by the promise of peace. From the moment Operation Desert Storm commenced on January 16th until the time the guns fell silent at midnight one week ago, this nation has watched its sons and daughters with pride, watched over them with prayer. As Commander-in-Chief, I can report to you our armed forces fought with honor and valor, and as President, I can report to the nation, aggression is defeated, the war is over. This is a victory for every country in the coalition, for the United Nations, a victory for unprecedented international cooperation and diplomacy, so well led by our Secretary of State, James Baker. It is a victory for the rule of law, 
for what is right. Desert Storm's success belongs to the team that so ably leads our armed forces. Our Secretary of Defense and our Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Dick Cheney and Colin Powell. standing. <laughs> this military victory also belongs to the one the British call the man of the match, the tower of calm at the eye of desert storm, General Norman Schwarzkopf. Jubilant room that night in Congress. We saw the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Colin Powell, Britt Scowcroft, National Security Advisor, Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense. A very happy President George H.W. Bush, and for very good reason. The war had gone exceedingly well. Less than 150 Americans had been killed. Stark contrast to the Estimates, the tens of thousands for American casualties against this fourth largest army in the world, Iraq. President Bush was not the only president celebrating the night of the 27th of February, 1991, in Baghdad. President Saddam Hussein was celebrating as well. Because coalition forces, after 100 hours of the ground offensive, had stopped. Stopped short of Baghdad. Why let Saddam go? In 1994, that question was posed to former Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney. Here's what he had to say. Do you think the U.S or UN forces should have moved into Baghdad? No. Why not? Because if we'd gone to Baghdad, we would have been all alone. There wouldn't have been anybody else with us. It would have been a U.S. occupation of Iraq. None of the Arab forces that were willing to fight with us in Kuwait were willing to invade Iraq. Uh, once you got to Iraq and took it over, and took down Saddam Hussein's government, then when are you going to put this place? 
that's a very volatile part of the world, and, and if you take down the central government of Iraq, you can easily end up seeing pieces of Iraq fly off, uh, part of the, what the Syrians would like to have to the west, uh, part of eastern Iraq, uh, the Iranians would like to claim for for eight years. In the north, you've got the Kurds, and if the Kurds spin loose and join with the Kurds in Turkey, then you threaten the territorial integrity of Turkey. And so it's quite hard if you go that far and try to take Iraq. The other thing was casualties. Uh, everyone was impressed with the fact that uh, we were able to do our job with as few casualties as we had. But for the 146 Americans killed in action, for their families, it wasn't too poor. And the question of the president in terms of whether or not we went on to Baghdad and took additional casualties in an effort to get Saddam Hussein was how many additional dead Americans is Saddam worth? And our judgment was uh, not very many, and I think we got it right. Quagmire if we proceeded on to Baghdad, so says the former Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney. really have nothing to say about that. But obviously, we're going to be returning to Iraq again. So what have we learned? Well, we began with the war launched by Saddam Hussein against his neighbor. His neighbor in the throes of a revolution, Iran. It was a war that was ineptly managed, arguably on both sides, but especially on the Iraqi side. A war that would drag on for eight years, result in hundreds of thousands of casualties on both sides of the line. A war that resembled in many ways World War I, War fought along the border. War fought between the cities of Baghdad and Tehran. War that was eventually fought in the Persian Gulf against oil tankers supplying badly needed oil to the rest of the world. The war in which we took a side. Iran was the arch nemesis. Iran that had just recently released. Americans taken hostage in the embassy in Tehran. Therefore, the old maxim is true in this situation. My enemy's enemy is my friend. And so in December of 1983, President Reagan sent his personal envoy, Donald Rumsfeld, to meet with Saddam Hussein and Tariq Aziz. That Iran-Iraq war would be so draining on Iraq that in 1990, Hussein would take drastic measures. Drastic measures was the invasion of Kuwait. $15 billion in debt, ripe, intact oil fields sitting there, and a statement on July 25th by the American ambassador, ambassador, April Glaspie, that the United States had no opinion, no opinion on Arab, Arab conflicts like the border dispute with Kuwait. Seven days later, Iraqi tanks pour into Kuwait. Five days after that, American ground troops are deploying into Saudi Arabia for Operation Desert Shield. Six months, Operation Desert Shield would last because of the fear, the fear of America, fear of Vietnam. The Senate voted 52-47 to authorize the use of force. That's a close vote, especially for a war vote. However, Operation Desert Storm would be over in a matter of weeks with boots on the ground for only 100 hours. But Saddam Hussein remains standing. We're going to return to meet Saddam Hussein again.